Hello, everyone. I'm Phil Parsons, along, alongside a couple former Busch Series winners, Hermie Sadler and Hank Parker Jr. Hermie, this is one of the racetracks that the Busch Series really looks forward to coming to. This is a big race, big purse, over a million four. You got a big crowd on hand. It's sell out again for six years in a row. But this is, it may be big and wide, but it's not necessarily the easiest place to drive. There's a couple tricky spots on this racetrack. Well, it is, Phil. This is a great big wide racetrack. We'll see three, sometimes four wide racing, a lot of parts of these racetrack. Let's go down to Jack Rubens with Tony Stewart, the crew chief on Jack Miller's car. And they've done a removal of diagnostics. They've had to replace one of the ECUs. Tony, the ignition is what gave up. He said the battery must have went dead. I don't know. We had a battery problem yesterday. I don't know if it's something that's shortened the battery out or not, but uh, the battery went down to 30 battery and it fired right up and sent it back out. Dr. Miller's back out on the racetrack, guys. Good to hear that. Ooh, the lead battle's tightening up. Bobby's looking on the outside. Now, this, um, this is something we haven't seen yet, Alan, and, and it doesn't look like we're going to see it here. It looked for a second like Bobby Dotter was going to try to run around the top side of Austin Cameron and grab the lead, but he's went to the bottom. It looked like, oh, what a move. And is that, that his teammate? That is his teammate, Gene Christensen, who got up high in the lane that Austin Cameron was running. I don't think it was anything intentional, but it certainly helped his team effort <laughs> out. It looked perfectly <laughs> choreographed, but I don't think anyone could have could have planned out a move so nicely. If they can have a little bit of bad luck for Bobby Hamilton, they can get right back in this thing. Well, Chad, we've talked about the improved field in the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. Does that make it more difficult for a Carl Edwards and a Ted Musgrave to get those two spots to get into the top spot? You know, it's not impossible, but they definitely have their work cut out for them. I'd say it's next to impossible, really. I think you're looking at just Dennis Setzer has the only legitimate chance at catching Bobby Hamilton at this point. I know Phil doesn't agree, but it takes a lot of problems for Phil. I mean, not just for <laughs> Phil, but for Bobby and for Dennis, for those other two guys to have a chance to get up there. Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Arood, and welcome to round seven of the 10 race Pep Boys Indy Racing League 1999 schedule. These are the cars that compete annually at the Indianapolis 500. And joining us topside is a man who has covered the IRL since its inception, Vince Welch. The 23-car field today will be led by Team Kelly. Its two drivers occupy the top spots in the front row, led by Mark Dismore. There are a lot of teams that are looking at cars with 8th to 12th place speed that think that they can hedge and save their tires for the very end of the race, hoping for a pit stop with five laps to go and maybe drive up through the wind. That's so interesting, Len and DJ. We were talking about that. How long can you wait? Yeah, copy. You looked real good in one and two. I think you learned a few times when you were overdriving the interest there, and you learned how to kind of get up off of that corner better. Uh, you still send it into three, two, a little too hard where I'm at. Looks like you could go in a little easier and keep it, keep it lower. Even though you go in hard, you run off real good. The car's really good. looks really good. If the 25 is a decent car, your car looks really, really good. Mike Bliss and company going to victory lane after a performance in which he led 74 of the 186 laps on this afternoon. It's Bliss, Greg Biffle, Ron Hornaday, Joe Rutman, and Andy Houston, the top five. Now the Plasticoat winning finish award. Let's go to Larry McReynolds. Well, Alan, I got quite a group down here. I got Barry Dobson, Jimmy Smith, and I believe this is engine builder. Looked like he was going to be tire changer today. Robert Yates Barry, second win of the season, and you did it in dominating fashion. Now joining me on pit road today here is former ARCA champion, my colleague, Bill Venturini. Thanks, Glenn. Well, yesterday, while this gentleman over here was over at Martinsville qualifying a cup car, Mike McLaughlin put his car strongly in the field, but there's going to be a driver change. Todd Bodine is going to have to start last. But that's not the only thing you've got. This is, a, what, the first time this year that you've now done double duty. What's it look like for today and the rest of the year? Well, uh, you know, I think there were six conflicts that we had for this year, and the way we've got it figured, I can race all six. Uh, other than that, I don't know. I might allude to my colleague over here, uh, Jeff, and see if he knows any other differences in the uh, cars. Well, Jeff Fuller, 1992 Modified Tour Champion, you're doing the second part of our show today and helping us with the first part also. Tell us a little bit about the Bush Grand National cars and also a little bit about the Modifieds today. Well, the Modifieds are 800 pounds lighter. They've got a foot more rubber hitting the ground. They've got a lot of power, and they draft a lot better than these cars. And you're going to see one whale of a race today. I mean, those Modifieds get down and get funky here. <laughs> <They do. laughs> 